Welcome to the Ben and Lauren Show. I'm Ben, and here's Lauren. And after, what, several weeks, we're back again. Three weeks. Three weeks. We're back. <laughs> We've been kind of reluctant to do the next Ben and Lauren Show because... I don't know. Why have we been reluctant to do the next Ben and Lauren show? Because Jamie died and it took an emotional toll on us. Well, that's Believe about it right. Or not. Yeah, Saturday would come and we'd say, are we doing Ben and Lauren show? And like, nah, I'm tired. Let's go to bed. Well, we started doing this show because Zach and Jamie Bauer from the American Homestead used to do a podcast every Saturday night for, it had been close to a year. It was about a year. And it was really fun to me. We would make sure the kids were in bed and we would get everything set up and we would kind of listen in and we'd, we'd talk to other people on the chat program and it was kind of like, it wasn't really a date. But it was kind of a fun evening for us. It was. It was It was a really nice evening. And then um, Zach filmed Butchering a Cow, which included shooting the cow. <laughs> and uh, YouTube kicked him off for a while. We didn't, didn't have anyone to talk to anymore. There was nothing going on on Saturday night. And he said, well, maybe we can do one, and then we'll get people talking with us again. It's like chatting with people. So that would have been 50 episodes ago? 50 episodes ago. Or more? Well, it's 50 episodes, but it's a lot more than 50 weeks because we've had gaps. In, we've had in some there. good gaps. Uh, it's been over a year. Our first Ben and Lauren show was going back quite a, quite a ways. It was last summer, so maybe a year and a couple months. Mm-hmm. So... For some reason, I think losing Jamie made us kind of not feel like doing the podcast either. Yeah. Which is a weird reaction, but there it is. Well, again, Saturday nights would come and we'd just sort of say, yeah, let's go to bed. <laughs> Doesn't help that we still have a one month old. <laughs> <laughs> well, tonight we're here. We're doing the Ben and Lauren show. And we have our list. And we get to be together still. Yes, and we are together. It is the Ben and Lauren show, or the Ben, what is it, the Lauren and Ben show? Well, uh, let's go back. Thanksgiving was our eighth wedding anniversary. Mm -hmm. So every so often our wedding anniversary lines up with Thanksgiving. And last year, or this year rather, uh, it lined up. So also Daniel's birthday is right around that time. So we've got this strange thing where Thanksgiving will either hit our wedding anniversary or Daniel's birthday. It could be either one, yes. Daniel was actually born on Thanksgiving Day, the year that he was born. Yep. I couldn't believe it because he was almost two weeks late. And every day I was expecting him to be born, kind of like with Rebecca. And then finally, the day before Thanksgiving, it's like, well, baby's not born. I guess I'm going to get to have Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> so <laughs> Daniel's birthday is which day? It's the, 20 it's the 23rd. Third. Of November. So, so we have the 23rd for his birthday and 28th for our anniversary and Thanksgiving floats around in between that time span. Now, from now on, we have Rebecca's birthday on the 1st of November. Oh, yeah. And now we have Rebecca's birthday, the 1st of every November. So November's getting to be a busy month. <laughs> it's an eventful no month. So we didn't do anything special, really, for our anniversary, if you, aside from going to my family's for Thanksgiving, which is pretty special, but not particularly for our anniversary. So the 28th this year uh, was the day that Jamie died. That may be another reason why we didn't go out for an anniversary either. <laughs> so You would not think that it would take such a toll on us. We're far away in many ways. It, it's just the timing is odd. That it would land on our anniversary. It would land on Thanksgiving. It's just the timing is odd to me. We've had Thanksgiving has been kind of an odd time for us. In many ways. You know, Daniel being born on Thanksgiving. Yeah, we've had a bunch of weird stuff happen. Yeah, Daniel was born on Thanksgiving. It's a moving holiday. Right. Well, we just we just talked about that. That, Anyways, that was just, that year. It's just interesting. So that explains why we haven't been doing the Ben and Lauren show lately. Um, tomorrow is her memorial. And we actually did think about making the trip out there. We just not going to be able to do it. Things with our family and things with our actual ability to physically get down there to Arkansas made it not possible for us really to get there right. <clears throat> right so here we are here we are we are not in arkansas <laughs> now my understanding is they're going to live stream it or something so well turner family christmas is tomorrow but we should be back in time to do that because i think that's at eight o'clock our time yep so tomorrow afternoon we're going to head out 
And of course, I had all these ambitious plans for tomorrow, but I... In the afternoon, our afternoon is going to be taken up. I have to have an early morning if I want to get anything done. Well. I've been getting up early lately. That has to do with your sales training. Yes, because I have <laughs> sales training. I have to be there by 8.30. It takes about an hour to get there. So I'm not an early riser, so that shouldn't be such a big deal. But for me, it's a big deal. <laughs> well, you have to get up like about 6.45 really to make sure that you get there on time when all is said and done. Typically, our family gets up somewhere between 8.30 and 9, which is late for most people. Usually, I'm up at 7.30 to 8. I mean, actual up, getting things together, well, making that's, breakfast. Yeah, that's when all the kids are up and about. But I'm usually up with the babies around 7.30, Daniel and Rebecca, around 7.30. Because there is a difference between, between being awake and being up. I'm busy and my day has started at 7.30. <laughs> when do you put your shoes on? Well, that's after I've changed multiple sets of diapers and gotten other kids dressed. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I my day my begins. My right. day begins when I get the coffee brewing. So <laughs> uh, I get the coffee brewing at six thirty when when it's a class. Right. So you've been going on Wednesdays and Fridays. Mm -hmm. And on Wednesdays he has actual training. On Fridays there's a master class. Now last Friday was neat because I got to take my wife, and that was great. We brought Rebecca too. Mom and Dad watch the kids for us. This is a really big event for it us is. to have all the kids stay home and just take the baby. Yeah, and she got to meet all the people that I've been working with, and it's it was great. That was fun. It was fun. They even had snacks for us. They had this um they had this day where you're supposed to spend time planning what your goals are for this year. And they call it a vision board, which sounds kind of new agey to me, but. It's basically a piece of cart of construction paper. You put pictures of all the things you want to accomplish in, in an indeterminate amount of time. And uh, ours was odd. <laughs> yeah, they had piles and piles and piles of magazines lying around on the table where you, you could look through to find pictures to put on your little board of, you know, describing what you wanted. And a lot of people are picking out, like, pictures of a brand new Corvette or some such thing. Piles of cash. It, Vacations. You know, things like that. And for us, we were looking for <laughs> a canvas tent. <laughs> so we had canvas tent. Actually, we did have a vehicle on there, though. We had the... We did put a vehicle, but a it van. was a 12-passenger van. <laughs> <laughs> I think our vision board was the only one with a 12-person van on it, guaranteed. It may have been the only vision board with a Sukkot tent on it, too. I'm sure it was. And I definitely think ours was the only one that had Sabbath oil on it. <laughs> Ours was a little unusual. <laughs> Which we put on there to remind us. We were talking about what it's like to keep your, your lamp full of oil, like in a parable, so that you are ready for what God wants you to do and ready for Messiah when he comes. Right. And that's important. I think it's a pretty long-term goal. But anyway, we put a jug of oil on our, <laughs> our vision board. Well, no, it was, a, it was a lit lantern with a giant jug of oil next to it. Yes, it prominently says Shabbat oil, Shabbat oil on oil. Oh, does it? I didn't catch that part. Yes, it does. Oh, I, I didn't even catch that part. You didn't notice that? No. Oh, that's funny. It does. It says... I it, just figured it was oil. I think it says Shabbos oil, so it would be the Yiddish for <laughs> Shabbat. That's funny. I, di I didn't even <laughs> make didn't that even connection. <laughs> um, so that, that, was, uh, that was this Friday. Mm -hmm. And we've been seeing some results from your sales training, too. I think so. We had our... One of our big failures this summer came back. Came back as not a failure. And we're hoping that it'll go through the spring. Ben did something quite different when he was talking to the man. This time he communicated with him totally differently. And it, it has had drastically different results. We actually talked about it in one of the Ben and Lauren shows. Have we discussed talking to him again? Because he had. Not again, the original. The original, time. right. But. Um, so basically, uh, back, it would have been springtime, summertime, mm -hmm. sometime like Spring. that. Spring. And um, that was the one at the Detroit Arsenal. And uh, and I don't know, things went south with it. Um, he kind of went quiet, and I was emailing him and emailing him and emailing him for about three months. And he finally responded after three months, and he says, basically, I, you're just trying to mooch off, off of us and... I don't, he said that the we amount of testing that you want to do makes it look to me like you're trying to gather data on the government dime. And we're, and we're like, what? Yeah. 
this is, so, this is OSHA mandated testing. We, we took his response and we kind of took it personally and just got quiet. So I started taking this training and in one of the classes they um, had us recount um, kind of rejection. An embarrassing failure. An embarrassing failure basically. So I pulled out my phone and I actually read verbatim what he said to us in the email. And of course to my ears it sounded devastating. Um, out Everyone of, at the table there did say ouch. Well out of context just reading that one line sounded devastating. But when you read the whole thing in context and it's not so bad. Actually, he wasn't slamming the door as much as I thought he was. As you've been talking to him more the last week or so, I think that's just his communication style. He is very blunt and very, very blunt. direct. So the shocker, of course, is that I'm talking with my, you know, my peers, and um, they said, you, you should call him back. I'm thinking, oh, I can't call him. It's been three, four months, and just it's dead, and I'm not, why would I do that to myself? This is a deadly... <laughs> So I was working up the courage to um, call him. I actually was about to do it. And the weirdest thing happened. He emailed us. What a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences. Neither do I. <laughs> so, of course, I'm like, what do I do with this? I have to answer this just perfectly. And I need to, you know. So um, he said he'd like to revisit his, our turnkey proposal. And so I responded with, could you define turnkey? Which and is did. totally different than you approached it before because what happened before was he kept asking for a turnkey proposal and he kept trying to look up what is a turnkey proposal. <laughs> and we did all this work to figure out what turnkey is and then we presumed we understood what he meant. This time around, Ben just sent him an email saying, could you define turnkey <laughs> proposal for me? And he yeah, did in I bullet did. points. It was like three bullet points long. Yep. So, And he um, said, oh, that's what you wanted. So right away I established a meeting with him and uh, I went solo. Which is interesting because every time previous, there was always a big crowd of people that came. And I was often there with them, but not solo. So this time I went solo. And um, it was a very short meeting to the point. It was mostly just a reintroduction, getting some basic things down. And, um, and to set up another meeting. And the second, the second meeting you went to, you, you told them that you wanted to get a water sample so that you could have a better idea of what we actually needed to do to this town. What I'm shocked about is he actually suggested it, which I think he knew I was going to ask something like So I think he wanted to kind of beat me to the punch. Well, this time when you went in for a meeting, you sat down and discussed with him, what is it about the water testing that's a problem? Mm -hmm. And he told you that he didn't have a problem with water testing and he understood why it needed to be done, but he felt that what we wanted to do was a little bit too excessive. Yeah, so... He wanted to test the water every three months instead of every month. It's like, oh, well, that's what he wanted. Just the fact that we're meeting again, talking, moving forward, getting time frames, um, getting budgets together, I, it's, a, it's a promising sign. So we have another meeting set up in, uh, what, January 9th. And I do not think there is any coincidence at all that it, as you basically took hold of the reins and said, look, we have to do something to revive our company, and one of the things I need to do is learn a better method for for selling than I have been using my I you you said I need to to refine this skill mm -hmm. I need this skill to get better yep I do not think it's any coincidence that immediately you're given an opportunity to revisit one of the things that really we had no clue before why that didn't work and this time you went back and looked at it and you said aha I understand what I did. I understand <laughs> what happened here. Yeah, I looked back and I had a pretty clear idea from his perspective why why he responded the way he did. And um, I was thankful. Something we said, we must have done something to impress him because he did contact us again. So That's good. But I, I guess what I see as really encouraging out of that is that you have more confidence. You understand better what you want to do differently and there's some clear results from that and they're good results so far right. I mean we're seeing some good things there yeah and when you're winging it as a salesperson it's pretty tricky um, you don't have steps that you actually follow or, or you have no idea where you are in the process and all this kind of stuff now we've got a, a more clear path moving forward as far as selling things that's I think that's been a very good development over the last couple of weeks. And selling is a noble pr profession. <laughs> it's 
So that you keep reminding yourself, being a salesman is actually a noble profession. You're not supposed to be a sleazy salesman. Mm -mm. You're supposed to be a good salesman. A good salesman helps people to find the thing that they wanted to buy right. and make it a, a smooth process for buying it. There's a quote that I really like a lot. It's, um, people hate to be sold, but they love to buy. Yeah. It's true. People hate to be sold, but they love to buy. Because people do have an idea of what they want to purchase. They just don't want someone forcing them to buy something they weren't interested in buying or tricking them into it or guilting them into it. Mm -hmm. And it's not even receiving the product itself. It's the actual process of buying. People saying, actually do enjoy shopping. And Yeah, shopping. And it feels <laughs> good to say, okay, let's do this. And right. having it be done. So they can go to bed at night saying, aha, it's all done. Taken care of. Taken care of it. And that's what people really want. Just, just, I want this taken care of. Speaking of which, we got a new stove. Yes, we did. <laughs> That's a whole story in itself. The short version is my mom found a $1,500 stove on Craigslist for a couple of hundred dollars. So it, it, to recap on the stove, uh, we had the bottom burner spectacularly. The heating element, heating element exploded. <laughs> spectacularly burned out. And uh, we actually did hire someone to come in and take a look at it. We thought it would be just popping a new, you know, heating element. But apparently something happened to fry the, I don't know, the... The controller. Electronics in the controller. So he said, he took the heating element back and he said, sorry, you just need to buy a you new one. You need a new oven. We were a little sad about that, but what are you going to do? Well, I was particularly sad because I didn't really want to go buy a really cheap oven because we... Use it. We spend all our time here. We cook all our meals pretty much ourselves. I mean, to get pizza, to go out to eat or something, that's we extremely We use that stove rare. every day. That stove is in use for three meals a day and sometimes a snack. And now, the oven is also in use. Well, now the old stove did work fine. All the burners worked fine. It was just the it was just the oven. The oven did not work. So we were using a little toaster, toaster oven. Toaster oven. Which actually worked pretty effectively for a number of weeks to, to bake whatever we needed to bake. But it had some limitations. It does have some limitations. And it took a lot of time. It's like when the dishwasher goes out. Wash dishes just fine. It takes up just a lot more time. So we've had the dishwasher go out, the stove go out, and the washing machine go out. I'm just hoping the refrigerator <laughs> stays it's like, alive. <laughs> it's like, what's next? Of course, it's cold outside right now. That's helpful yeah, if the refrigerator helpful. were to go out. No, that'll go out in the summer. <laughs> anyway, so... So um, we discovered that really we're going to need a new stove, but it wasn't quite as high of a priority as getting the washing machine working. So yeah, I put that went out a couple of weeks later. So I put a lot of my energy into the washing machine, which is an, another story. Um, and Lauren's family found out about the stove and decided that they were going to help us out. My mom had the brilliant idea to start looking on Craigslist. It didn't even occur to me to check Craigslist. I think we're going to have to go buy a new appliance. No, you don't have to buy a new appliance. You just have to buy one that's working and in good shape. Right. So. Something to keep in mind for the future. So um, we were looking at a couple different models. First one we looked at was very inexpensive. Um, it was uh, black, and like all black. And... Um, I don't know. I wasn't real keen on it. And I found one that was white that um, was actually cheaper. Right. Um, and I was going to suggest that one. But then your mom found one that was stainless steel that was a fantastic price. And it was normally... Yeah, it, it wasn't really the finish. The other two were basically the same kind of stove. But the problem was that they were both sitting in people's garages. And you really couldn't test to see if they were working or not. But they wanted found, to find one that was actually in the kitchen previously right. used. My dad had suggested you better find one that you can make sure it's working before you buy it. And she did right around. The, it was in the same subdivision that they live in. And the lady was redecorating her kitchen and she does not like having an electric stove. Well, we don't have a hookup for a gas stove, so we don't really have much of a choice unless we run a, run a gas line. Right. So we got this electric stove and it's got two ovens in it. So there's a little oven and a big oven. It's got five burners. It's a really nice stove. It is a very nice stove. It's a stove we would not normally afford. Well, we can't normally spend $1,500 on a stove. I think, no. I think it's up to $1,800 now. I can't even imagine. So, so we've got a very nice stove now. That was really oven. nice. Ovens, plural. Had, and you, you and Dad had to rewire the plug so it mm -hmm. would fit. That was an adventure a little bit. It wasn't too hard, though. In the meantime, our washing machine, you have fixed both parts that broke. Yeah, there were two parts in the washing machine that was broke. The first time... 
opened it up, replaced that part, still didn't work. So I opened it again, getting deeper, and replaced some more parts, put it back together. Then it worked. And it worked, except for one very important thing. After three loads of laundry, it stopped telling the wash tub to stop filling with water. So you can imagine, you know, you, you put all your laundry in there, and it starts filling up, and you go upstairs and go on with your day, and next thing you know, What's you got it? a waterfall. Why did I hear water? <laughs> <laughs> you have a waterfall going into the drain. Now, fortunately, we've got a drain right there, so it's not going to flood the basement. As you say, it may have hiked our water bill. But it's a waste of water. Oh my goodness. That so all you, have, all you have to do is move the little knob over and it'll keep going through the cycles. But There's two points in the cycle where it does this. It's at the wa initial fill and then the rinse cycle. So Ben got it to work, to agitate, to you know, to work. And then the next day I put laundry in and it's running away. And I, I, you know, I fill the tub manually by watching and turning it off, turning off the water when it gets to full. And it's working away and I'm upstairs again and Ben goes down to check on something and well during the rinse cycle it fills the tub again apparently it doesn't shut the water off for that part either waterfall all over the yeah. <laughs> so we flooded the basement like four times trying to learn how to get the washing machine and who knows work. how much water we just <laughs> anyway thankfully it just got the floor all wet so we've gotten to the point now where we set the timer so we know when to go downstairs and to move the knob yeah currently the washing machine situation is i fill the tub manually it <laughs> agitates you know, because I, I advance it forward manually. It agitates. And then when I when it begins agitating, I set the timer for 10 minutes. Then I have to run downstairs at the end of 10 minutes and move it ahead just like a <laughs> half an inch forward so that it will then, you know, empty and spin the clothes instead of rinsing forever. Yep. But I washed all the laundry. And you know what I told myself? This is faster than going to the laundromat. It's even faster than going next door to mom and dad's house. And I don't have to do it all by hand. So it didn't do that, obviously, before I started tinkering with the washing machine. I must have broken I don't something. No, what's wrong? Well, you had to keep bending the back, the, the control panel back over the back of the washing machine. Maybe it I was, suspect something has gotten kinked or damaged. I think there. it was when I kicked it. <laughs> you kicked the control panel? <laughs> no. I kicked the washing machine a few times. Well, you were trying to get the case on. Yeah. I'm assuming you didn't kick it because you were mad at it. Oh, no. Not, not at all. <laughs> Okay, I lost my temper one time, but that was because I was wrestling with the thing, and then it bit me. Well, sort of. We <laughs> I had, pinched my finger in one of the... Well, we had the case off. At one point, our kids decided, apparently, to use it as a fort. <laughs> we were not aware of this, so Ben went to put the case back on, and it was bent. Yeah, so I couldn't... Basically, it came off nice, but it didn't, did not go back on nice. More of the story... Don't let your kids be in the basement while you've got the washing machine disassembled. You never know what enters the foolish minds of small children. That <laughs> yeah, was not good. But why? If, why? I banged it back into place and it sort of fits now. So it, it looks pretty good. You got it clipped on at the bottom, and but the obviously the timer doesn't work. Something isn't working right. So that's the side of the washing machine. So washing machine, stove, who knows what appliance will be next? <laughs> <laughs> We're running out of them. Um. So. We talked about, oh, graduated, uh, Abigail graduated. Oh, yeah, Abigail finished her first math module. This is a very exciting day because she's our biggest. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she did two sets of 100 problems, addition and subtraction, in under 20 minutes with 100% accuracy. With no coaching. With no coaching. The only coaching I did was stand there for moral support. Apparently, she does better if I'm standing there than if I'm not. <laughs> so Lauren promised a certain reward if she managed to do that. Well, this particular math module advised giving a, a special decorative ribbon or something as a reward, and I thought about getting one for Abigail, but when we were talking about it, she out of the blue, she goes, Mom, can I have some roller skates instead of a ribbon? <laughs> I'm like, roller skates? So, In the middle of winter, you know. Well, no, when she asked me this, it was almost a year ago now that I began really? working with them. It was last winter when I printed all those math sheets. So she's been doing this for a year. Yep. So she got a pair of roller skates. Then she's a little discouraged that she couldn't just put the roller skates on and skate away. But See, I wish I got prizes like that when I was at school. That would have been a great incentive for me. You know, a Lego set or something. Well, you know, it's the advantage of schooling your kids at home. When you finish that math book, you'll get a new Lego set. It's going to be weird when our children have their own Legos. Well, I don't want to get too much into offering bribes, but I they're do They're not think bribes, they're prizes. Well, there's a goal to work toward, too. It's not right. just, oh, congratulations, you finished your spelling book. How exciting. 
So that was a big deal. And Abigail had a really good time roller, bla- roller skating down in the basement. She fell a lot. She'll get better. But <clears throat> I thought her attitude was pretty good. Her tailbone was a little sore, but... It's still a little sore. I don't <laughs> want her to mess up her back, but... <laughs> uh, Rebecca is growing up fast. She's got a very expressive face. and She's already talking to us, sort of. We had her final infant check mm-hmm. uh, last week, uh, where the midwife, she comes back till the baby is six weeks old. And Abigail actually was six weeks old on Friday. So that so was, was, a little bit that was Goldie's last visit, wasn't that it? That was Goldie's last visit. She said, well, maybe I'll see you next year. Maybe. At our at our rate, yeah, it would be like the end of next year. <laughs> then we really need that big van. <laughs> we are out of room. Our, our vehicle's packed. Um, so she measured Rebecca, and I hadn't realized this, that Rebecca was 22 inches long when she was born. She's a big girl. That is our biggest baby. Our babies are usually between 19 and 20, a little bit over 20 inches long. I wondered why she was almost 9 pounds and she looked so skinny. Mm-hmm. Like, Abigail was, was smaller than that. When Abigail was born, she was like rolls, had rolls. So she, she has so fat. kind of a skinny body and a little head, but yet she's heavy. Yeah, she has such a little tiny face tall. that people keep thinking she's little. Well, Goldie weighed her, and she is now 23 inches long, 24 inches long. She is 24 inches long, and she weighs almost 11 pounds. So she's tall. She's a big girl. She's tall for a baby. She is, but she just looks so tiny. Like she's this little tiny peanut <laughs> with this little teeny tiny face, and she's not little at all. <laughs> just long legs. So she started smiling. Yeah, that's the big thing. She has a really cute smile. And talking. And talking, yeah. She's talking to us. When I talk to her, she talks back. And she looks right at you, too. Looks right in the eye, and she talks. She I'm talks sorry, to when, Abigail also. when you see a baby looking at you right in your eyes, and you're talking to them, and they respond, that's talking. You just can't understand what she's saying exactly. <laughs> it it really is like a babble. She's been a very good baby. <clears throat> yeah. We took her to the classroom on Friday and mm-hmm. she did great. She hasn't been colicky. She's been very peaceful. It is interesting though, uh, walking into that classroom with a baby, we got an instant crowd of <laughs> my dad women. Just, my dad says babies are chick magnets. It was a chick magnet. It was amazing. <laughs> They yeah, just everyone so, suddenly in the a, office shows up. Suddenly a big crowd of, ooh, look at the baby. Well, people don't really get a chance to see tiny babies all that often. Most people, if they have children, they have two or three children. And all their friends have two or three children, maybe. Mm-hmm. And then people don't take their small babies places. They find babysitters and whatever and leave them home. But she was great. I think people were wondering if she would be crying and making a big fuss, but she was totally quiet yeah, she was good so i was happy about that um what other the other project is i started some apple wine and we tried on thanksgiving we tried the dandelion wine and oh, yeah. the cranberry wine so that's right i forgot too. about that so yeah i brought both of the uh, dandelion wine and the cranberry wine and people tried it i really like the dandelion wine you didn't like it so much not at first my first sip of the dandelion wine i didn't like it but i really grew fond of it afterwards it's got a lot of different flavors in it from like there's it's orange It's quite good. It's also quite strong. Yeah, I think the alcohol content in that might be a little on the high it side. It is on the high side. <laughs> Maybe if you left it open for a little <laughs> while and let it... The cranberry wine has hardly no alcohol in it. Maybe you can. Maybe we should mix the two no, and see what no, they taste like together. Ugh, no. The cranberry wine did not turn out. I'm... I'm Are you going to dump it? I might. Try again? It's just... It's sour. It's just... It doesn't taste good doesn't have a lot of flavors in it well it has a very sour flavor yeah that's it though there's like nothing else it does it. have a cranberry it smells nice smells better than it okay, tastes it tastes like super duper sour cranberry juice so yeah it didn't really turn out for a first wine cranberry is probably a bit of a challenge i think blueberry would be better than cranberry probably so cranberry wine didn't turn out but the dandelion wine turned out quite good um I might even tweak that recipe a little bit in the future. But Ben was asking himself, why does nobody make wine with bread yeast? Why do you have to buy special yeast to make So wine? there was a special on just, you know, your from concentrate cheap apple juice. Apple juice. It was a dollar for a half juice. gallon. So I figured for $2 a gallon, I can make a $2 giant jug of, of wine. I'm like, well, hey, let's try it. And I thought, well, what's the cheapest yeast I can use? Well, 
bread yeast. I'm like, can I use bread yeast? So I looked it up, and they basically said, yes, you can use bread yeast, but it, why? Because, you know, the expensive stuff works better. But also, I, they said that you can using bread yeast, you often get some very funny flavors. But it turns out that bread yeast, <laughs> it's, uh, it's called homestead wine because a lot of homesteads don't have access to the fancy yeast packages. Although, these days they do. Not with Amazon, of course they do. Right. But back in the day, what your homestead would use whatever yeast you used to make your bread every day to make wine. So I wanted to try it. I said, well, let's give it a go. And it was bubbling like crazy. Bubble, bubble. And now it's uh, it stopped bubbling, but now it's uh, starting to clarify. I would say that it looks like it ferments faster than the regular wine yeast. Well, also the apple juice is super sweet. And I added sugar. So... <laughs> We'll see. I did add some, um, what do they call it, uh, yeast food. You did? Yeah, I added some nutritional yeast oh. food to it. And uh, I could add a little more to if I want to get the fermentation going again. Because it's not bubbling now at all. Hardly. So that was our highlights of three weeks? That was pretty much it. it seems like more happened in three weeks than all that. Well, oh, a the lot fence. has happened. If I finished the fence... I took a trip out to deliver canned... Well, I worked on... First, we finished our applesauce. Mm -hmm. Then I worked on making canned food and to send over to the Bauer family. Yep. Because there was people coming into town for a women's retreat that was near Ann Arbor. So I actually made stuff and then drove out to meet them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was an interesting trip. Now, that was while my dad and I went on uh, to training in the morning. Great. And I was wondering if you could make the trip out there by yourself. I wasn't going to mention that you said that. <laughs> oh, sorry. I just mentioned that. <laughs> she, uh, she's, a great, she's a good driver. She just doesn't drive very often. That's all. So. See, since we've been married, I don't know that Ben has ever really seen me drive because the only time I drive is if he's not there for some reason. I drive all the time. So Ben always drives. He has since we first began seeing each other. But before Ben came around, I was the biggest errand runner of my family i drove every day i'm a fairly aggressive driver i'm not really a very passive driver i think just the idea of me being one place and you being with the whole family all the children driving around without me just seemed strange it is strange it's very unusual i don't think i've ever done that where i've gone that far without you mm -hmm. since we've been seeing each other and i got home before you did so at any, any rate, to deliver the food, the one day that we really could meet up with everybody, Ben was just, there was no way he was no. going to be able to make it. Mm -mm. So I packed all five kids in the car. We went for a drive. I don't know how she did that. One I mean, kid at a time. <laughs> I mean, how did you manage five children by yourself? I guess you do that a lot during well, the I day. Well, I did have a little help because the people I was meeting with, like... Well, yeah. There was a couple points where... Uh, we stopped, We went to a Panera Bread and we visited for a little while. And um, like at one point, several of the girls had to go to the bathroom. And I left Rebecca with, I, I think Gina or Teresa was holding her. So hmm. It's like, oh, I'm going to go take the kids to the bathroom. Because managing the kids and the car seat that was or and the baby, that was going to be a really big trick. And I never had to do that. How long was it? About maybe an hour, you said? Yeah, an hour and a half. Hour and a half. We were able to visit. That was really, really nice. Good. Especially since we can't go down to Arkansas for the memorial. It was really nice to be able to see people. Makes it kind of a minutes. little more relaxed, sort of. Felt like we were able to sit down and just chat. Talk to people a little bit. Yeah. It's funny how if you have friends that live a long way away and things happen, how much you want to be able to see them. So that's, um, we're not able to go down for the memorial tomorrow, but at least we were able to get some food down to the down to them yeah we sent food and since they don't have a refrigerator that's why i sent food canned in jars. foods yeah so that food can go in the pantry for later because everyone's going to be bringing food right now but it's a it's a couple weeks couple months from now it's going to be where rubber long, hits the road some long-term food canned food applesauce it's homemade applesauce from michigan apples so we ended up getting 40 quarts of applesauce this year I was well that's really a big update I was really pleased. 40 quarts. Because when I knew that we were going to be expecting a baby the middle of October, I didn't really think we could do applesauce this year. And that's a big deal to our kids. We make applesauce every year. And usually once a week or so, I'll put applesauce on the table with dinner, and the kids really like it. They will go through a whole quart so at Lauren, a sitting. Do you remember how much we spent on apples? 
It was like 30 bucks, wasn't it? $28? Was it three for $12? Three bags? Do we get three bags? So it's $36. Mm-hmm. But 40 quarts? That means it was less than a dollar a quart. It was less than a dollar a quart. So that's a lot of cook, applesauce. We buy we buy deer apples to make applesauce out of because they just are apples that have hit the ground and because you're boiling them you get rid of any kind of fungus or any problem that be in there. And uh, this year But the truth is those apples are fine. The apples that we got this year, skipping ahead in the story, were in beautiful shape. I they threw were. out one apple. I mean of, you can eat them just out of plain. three bushels of apples, I threw one out. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't even I didn't find any worms. There's only a few that were bruised. They're in beautiful shape. I'm pretty sure they were gala apples, which is perfect for applesauce because they're firm enough that they have lots of juice in them, and yet they're not like red delicious apples. You don't ever want to make applesauce. Out they of might still have more apples. Well, I'm done making applesauce <laughs> for the year, I think. But anyway, if you want to feed apples to the children for a couple months, I mean, that's a cheap way to do it. Four dollars a half bushel or something like that. So I didn't. We we kept trying to get apples in the orchard. We usually get them from. Kept saying they didn't have any deer apples. I think they were making them into cider. They were. So we kept calling. We kept calling. And we kept calling. And it wasn't until the week of Thanksgiving that they finally said they had apples. We've never had to wait that long for apples. The end of November. Yeah. I mean, apples start coming in around here the middle of September. <laughs> Pretty much. So by the time we could get apples, I was recovered enough from having had Rebecca that I could actually work on and can applesauce. It was fun. God worked it out for us. It worked out great. And the girls helped. They did a lot of help. Tremendous help this year. All I had to do was set the pot of cooked apples on the counter next to the food mill. The next thing you know, I've got three little girls over there pouring apples into the mill and milling out the applesauce. (laughs) So I think we've pretty much covered our week, our weeks. Um, we could talk about the Torah portion, what we talked about last night. Well, there was one big thing that we could cover from the Torah portion, one big surprise. And Amalek. Amalek. <laughs> we found out that Amalek is related to Esau. It's Amalek, Esau's grandson. He's his illegitimate grandson. Basically illegitimate grandson. His Esau's oldest son, Eliphaz, had a son by a quote-unquote concubine. It's interesting how they have wives and concubines, but mm-hmm. I think the concubine's children were not really considered like legitimate heirs. No, but the baby that was born from Eliphaz and the concubine was named Amalek. The, found, the foundation of the Amalekites. Amalekites. Now, the Amalekites are the people who just attacked the Israelites while they were at, um, at Sinai. Attacked them for apparently no reason. And God said after that that he would be at war with Amalek through all their generations. So later, King Saul is told to wipe out the Amalekites, all of them. And this is actually the incident that caused Saul to be discredited from being king. Because God said, wipe everybody out. And instead... Saul, and he said, don't keep any of the plunder. Instead, Saul's men kept a lot of the loot, and he kept King Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. So there was two observations. One, in our Torah portion, there's a lot of detail about the genealogy of Esau Mm -hmm. and the Edomites. And then later on, we learn about how God uh, brought the Edomites into their land before the Israelites. Dispossessed the giants in their land first. So there's a... There's a whole story of, of the Edomites coming into the land and wiping out the giants. And God makes a point to say, this is their land. You don't tread on their land. You can't have it. It's already given out. So obviously God has a lot of, I guess, has a covenant. He protected Esau. He protected, with Esau, he protected Esau. They but were yet, Isaac's children. But yet at the same time, there's the Amalekites. And even though the Amalekites are descended from Esau... God said, wipe them out. So many, many, many years later, we have a very famous villain in the story of Esther, whose name is Haman, Haman, Haman. the Agagite. He is a descendant of King Agag, the Amalekite. Right. So basically, the story of Esther is about one of Esau's descendants trying to wipe out the entire, the entire descendant, the entire family of Jacob. It's like Esau's grudge just got passed down through one generation and went down to uh, Eliphaz and on to Amale- uh, the Amalek 
and into the Amalek family. So they've just got this massive grudge against the Israelites. And it never goes away. That it never goes away. Even into on the, on even into on. the dispersion, off into uh, Persia, uh, the, <laughs> the descendants of Amalek are still trying to take out the Israelites. But what I find fascinating about that is, therefore, Haman, one of the greatest villains in the Bible, everyone, you know, every year in Purim, everyone goes boo, boo. every time his name is mentioned. The man is a descendant of Abraham and Isaac. He's Pretty descendant much. of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau instead of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yep. That and was shocking. The original Amalek is not that many generations away from Abraham, if you think about it. And or the, Isaac. But the Amalekites are seen as like one of the big bad guys of the earlier part of the Bible. They just descend on the Israelites for no apparent reason and start trying to slaughter them. I think actually it was all the loot they'd taken from Egypt. I think the Amalekites must have figured out that the Israelites had something worth taking. So it's family feud. Family feud. Now in one of the apocryphal books, it describes that Eliphaz was sent as a young teenager after Jacob to kill Jacob when he was fleeing to Laban. So the Eliphaz and Amalekite tradition. But instead of killing Jacob, he merely stole the money that he had taken with him as a bride price. Which ex explains why he didn't have it. But it does explain why Jacob would show up to Laban's... Poor. No money. With no money, even though his father is fantastically wealthy and his father specifically sent him to acquire a bride. <laughs> that is interesting. They're, they're but he couldn't acquire a bride. He had to work for the bride. Seven years. Because Eliphaz stole all his money. <laughs> and then had an illegitimate child that would try to steal all the money from his descendants. So, you know, from Laban's point of view, he remembers... The servant of Isaac coming in with all the riches and all the gold and all yeah, the... Yeah, what's Jacob doing showing up So the next generation poor. comes along and it's this dirt poor guy named Jacob. It's like, yeah, okay. But you got to work for it. You can have Rachel, but you got to work seven years. You can have Leah another seven years. Well, though, as Jacob pointed out to Laban later, it was little enough you had before I came. <laughs> Laban wasn't wealthy either. <laughs> no, he wasn't. <laughs> Apparently, he wasn't a very good shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, he didn't take the uh, gifts and invest them very well. They weren't given to him. They were given to his father. That's true. Rebecca didn't belong to him. But I wonder what happened to that wealth. Anyway, who was Laban's father? Do we know? Does it ever say? Bethuel, the son oh, of Bethuel. Nahor. Oh, Bethuel. I think Nahor is, is Abraham's father. father. Brother? Yes, and then Bethuel is his youngest son. And then Laban is the son of Bethuel. So the families join with Terah. Yes. Because Terah had, had Abram and Nahor. And Lot's father, who was Haran. And Haran? Haran. Those are the three sons of Terah. Interesting. I think. <laughs> I've forgotten somebody. So um, family feud. It's all in the family. The Amalekites are the children of Esau. We figured the Amalekites were some I thought they foreign... Were Canaanites. Canaanite. I thought they. Were, I, yeah, I never even paid attention to where the Amalekites came from. <laughs> or the Hivites. Got to look out for those Hivites. Shechem. Shechem. Ugh. Oh yeah, that's another whole story in our Torah portion. But it, maybe we can just. Stick yeah, it we're there. not going to go into that one. Maybe not that <laughs> story. That's depressing every single time. It is. It's a sad story. So that was our Torah portion. Anything else? It's uh, forty-five minutes almost. That covered three weeks. <laughs> 45 minutes covering three weeks not too bad and Rebecca didn't interrupt us because she's finally learned to be asleep at night but we're both yawning so I think might be good time to <laughs> time to say good night say good night Lauren good night Lauren <laughs> good night everybody good night